Welcome to The Real Deal, where God, His purposes, and His people are celebrated. I'm Rachel Inouye, bringing you encouragement through real life, people, and their stories. It's The Real Deal. Hey, let's get started. Hi, everybody. I am so glad you are joining me because today I have a guest that I'm very excited to meet. We just talked a minute ago before I bring him on, but I just want you to welcome with me Chris Blackaby. Many of you may know about him. Some of you in my audience may not, but he's somebody that I listen to a lot. Like I think I've consumed all of his YouTube content and I'm just really for him. And he has really guided me and kind of established some things in me that I know God had sent for me to know beyond just Early in here. So let me just tell you quickly about him. Chris is the creative education director of As He Is Ministries. He loves God, his word, and has a passion for the power of the gospel and demystifying the spiritual. With a profound understanding, and you'll hear this, with a profound understanding of the pure and undiluted gospel of the new creation, Chris has a passion for helping all God's children live a religion free life as sons of God and the redemption of creation. So I am so delighted Chris is with me today and I want everybody just to welcome him to the real deal because I'm really excited to have this conversation today. So Chris, there you are. Welcome again. Thank you for being on the real deal. This is super exciting for me. Super exciting. So pleasure. I, yeah, um, pleasure. I, I want to ask you lots of questions. I want you to go where you want to go. But I also just wanted to tell you that um, I feel like I'm grateful for you because there's a scripture that made me, I just want to honor you first before I ask you my rapid fire questions that I ask everybody. In Jeremiah 31 verse three, it says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. And Chris, that's my word for you. I just want uh, I've watched and seen you go through different haircuts, different times where you're available, not available in, in the public eye, you know, behind the scenes, but God has loved you with an everlasting love. And therefore he has continued his faithfulness to you. And I have a feeling you're going to tell us some of those hard things or places where God's been faithful. And I'm super excited. If it's okay, I just want to start with the random questions that are rapid fire that ask everybody that's on the real deal. Because it will get people used to you, and I love that you have an accent, and everybody has an accent, but yours is one that I want people to get used to. So don't overthink these, but just tell me, would you say okay. that you are a coffee or tea person? Oh, tea, coffee yeah. or tea? Definitely coffee. Okay. Coffee. Dog, cat, either, neither. Coffee. <laughs> uh, <And> well, <laughs> I, was allergic to, I was allergic to animals my whole life. And so I haven't had much to do with them, but if I wasn't, I would definitely be a dog person. Okay. Okay. Um, how, how about morning bird or night owl? Uh, <laughs> I, uh, my life is better when I go to bed early, but I, I do my most productive work between 8 p.m. and 12 p.m. <laughs> it's like, okay. but if I go to bed early, my life is so much better. <laughs> Yes, yeah. yes. Well, I, I, it makes sense. Would you consider yourself a books or a movies person? Movies. Okay. Easy. Silence or music? Yeah. Mm. Music. <laughs> okay. Leaned in or laid yeah. back? Well, this is a cultural thing because all Australians are laid back. So I'm a leaned in Australian which for an American is still laid back. <laughs> okay, that makes a lot of sense to me. That makes, A shower or bath? Shower. Okay. Driver or passenger, which do you prefer? 50-50. Uh, okay. Do you like eat at home or dine out? I did that one because of the pandemic when we couldn't go anywhere. I just kind of wondered where people felt. Do you like to eat in or dine out? Well, when I'm on the road and traveling, I eat out. All the time, like there'd be months will go by where I haven't eaten at home. And uh, if I have my own place, I cook. So there's my oh, answer. That's good. Yeah. Okay. I know this one has more to unpack than really the quick fire thing, but do you consider yourself an introvert or an extrovert? Well, uh, I enjoy people. 
care for people. And my mum, from a child, always told me I was an extrovert. But I have discovered <laughs> that this is not true. And uh, I spend a large amount of time by myself. If I don't, I, I begin to struggle. So if, that, if it's how you recharge, how you get energy, is the answer, then I get energy uh, by myself. Yeah. To totally makes sense. I mean, when our phone is low, we plug it in and let it be on a charger and we leave it alone for a bit. So it makes a lot of sense. Okay, so you know yeah. that you're on the real deal. And the real deal is because my dad was Richard Dean and he called himself RD and he would always tell us, just be the real deal. That meant authentically who you are. Wood should be wooden. Leather should be leather. Don't be fake. In our world, we would say, don't be a poser. But I learned from your friend, and I want to talk to you a little bit about this. I learned from your friend, um, Chad Mansbridge, that in Australia, you have your unique term. It would be like, who in your life is fair dinkum, I think he called it, or dinky die, or true blue, which means like, they are exactly who they are. And who's the real deal to Chris Blackaby, and how has it affected your life? Uh <laughs> That's a great question. I can do um, without someone was the real deal. And uh, <laughs> it doesn't mean it's a good thing. It's just that they are, right? Yeah. And um, I have a friend in Adelaide when I was really ill. So back in the early 2000s. And uh, his name was John. That's his real name. <laughs> Yeah. And he was just himself. Actually, didn't take into consideration like your opinion and your anything, uh, didn't change who he was. And from there, he was actually very compassionate and caring. But um, uh, when I saw a person uh, just be their natural self, I realized just how much. Um, I was overthinking things and uh, on a vigilant state and trying to address uh, what other people thought or what I thought they needed or I thought that they thought they needed, <laughs> right? Yeah. And, um, and uh, I worked out after spending time with John uh, that when he was young, his dad told him that he's okay. Like, you're good. You're my son. You're good. And that's John's default understanding he's good like no matter what happens mm. he's good do you know why his dad told me he was good 20 years ago <laughs> yeah and yeah that's just his default so he leave his job he start a new job i might go be a stockbroker for a while didn't work went back to his other job there's no impact on him uh, on, on his identity and for me at that time, yes i was terrified you know if i started a business and it collapsed that'd be it that's my one shot of doing something brave and great it didn't work. And, you know, I think maybe God wouldn't do that for me. You know, if my, my business collapsed, mm -hmm. that was God's opinion of me. Like, yeah, I had a very external locus of control. Other people's opinions defined how I felt about myself, even though I, I knew that shouldn't be that way. So I didn't think I thought that way <laughs> yeah. until I saw someone who was generally themselves. And, um, uh, for ch uh, church culture, we reward uh, niceness. And niceness oh. is a behavior. You're adjusting your behavior to what you believe the expectation of the person is. So uh, what you have to understand is niceness is to be fundamentally dishonest. That's uh, what niceness is. I couldn't is. agree more. It's, and it's not necessarily kind. It it's just nice. It's not kind. And it's not love, it's not good, it's deception. And you're deceiving yourself, you're deceiving others. And if you are being nice, you're not being your true self, which means you're not actually there. You're right. there. A persona of you is there. A persona you want someone else that you believe the person needs to respond to kindly or beneficially, which is manipulation. Right. Yeah. Right. Because I'm probably it's, a person that you want me to be now, like so on this interview. <laughs> I'm trying to manipulate a response from you. And so it's yeah. dishonest. 
Did you say, Chris, what do you like? Not yeah. saying, oh, is she cat person or dog person? She, she, she likes cats. She's going to be a cat person, you know, for example. Right. Across, and, across and chameleon. The ball, the ball. Yeah, yeah. And it so, leads to great anger because you're nice to get a result, but niceness doesn't get the result. You know, if you rock up and you're super nice, it means I have no needs, no requirements. I, I, I don't want anything back from this. And then you don't get anything back from it. <laughs> now you're angry because you had a, a covert contract that if I right. do this, they do that. If I'm good to my pastor for 20 years, he will make me the associate pastor. And he doesn't. Yeah. It was unspoken. And now you're angry. And, but you never had an agreement. You never actually stated what you were doing. So you're dishonest. It's manipulative. And uh, we can create many theologies, theological grids that cover this. Uh, right. And so, for example, um, I would never send food back, ever. And do you know why I'd never send food back? Let me tell you why I'd never send food back. I'm a son of a king. My life is good. This is just one meal of a thousand meals. Does it really matter? Mm-hmm. And who knows what that guy out the back is doing? Perhaps he's having a bad day. Perhaps his daughter's sick. Perhaps he needs this job. Perhaps he's understaffed. I don't know. I'm just going to let right. this food go. Yeah. Okay. Which sounds very loving if it was true. But it's right. not true. The truth was I can't handle conflict. <laughs> uh, I fear tension. And to me say, hey, excuse me, this burger is burnt. I don't have enough self-worth of myself to call someone over and explain it to them. And then we get the manager and explain it to them. I fear that tension. So I created a theology, a whole theological world around why I wouldn't send food back. So I was calling fear love. I was calling intimidation and tension the honor of Jesus Christ. There wasn't. Mm -hmm. So. God, in his wisdom, Mm -hmm. gave me many opportunities to send food back. (laughs) Right. Oh, yeah. It happened to me. It happened to me the other day. We can do it with anything. We can say God is sovereign if we don't want to take action. We can we can do a lot. of. We can call something humility when we really it's not humble. It's fear. And we we're thinking wrongly about somebody else's response to us or whatever. I. I seriously, I just want to honor you, Chris, because I have had such like from a fire hydrant when I like have your teaching. However, not just that, really agreeing with it. And I wanted to show you something that just makes me laugh. This is a file folder. Like when people used file folders back in when the dinosaurs roamed and there wasn't even computer. But back in 2018, I had a talk that I gave that was called, I am becoming all that I already am. I'm all that I already am. And when I started listening to you, and it was like, I made the ladies, like, he gave it, you know, from Second Peter 1, 3, I have everything I need for life and godliness. He gave it. I got it. I'm dead. You know, I've been crucified with Christ. He's alive and, and from Colossians. And then I'd say, and I'm new, you know, the whole Second Corinthians 5, 17, if anybody's in Christ, they're a new creation. I'm new and free to reflect his glory. And it would be from Second Corinthians, where it says your your you, your face is unveiled and you're becoming like Christ. And when I started listening to somebody who would say the very same things, I was like, oh my gosh, I feel so connected to this Chris Blackaby. And the thing is, is that even as I was stating it, ten years ago, I have become more of the very thing I was stating. And so it's it's interesting how, like, when I said I do, and I married Michael 38 years ago, I was a wife. Boom. But I began to learn some things like, okay, he prefers this and we like that and we work better together when we do this because I was becoming all the wife that I already was. And what I love is that you teach people and let people know you already are a son of God. And I'm a son of God as much as Michael's the bride of Christ. It's not a gender thing. But would you just kind of start with what I love is how you you talk to people about how Whatever you do, when you come to know things of God or the kingdom or Christ or Christianity, whatever the things are, something's framed up for you. Because you say that with such clarity, and I want my audience to kind of know, you came into this because of an environment you swim in. Yeah, yeah. Excuse me. Yeah, very much. So 
uh, if you are an English speaking Christian, uh, if you're not Catholic, you are basically a Reformed Catholic. If you're Protestant, you're a, you're a Reformed Catholic. You're Pentecostal, you're a Reformed Catholic. If you've left church and you're starting your own home group and, and pursuing the new, you're a Reformed Catholic. Because all we're doing is taking Catholicism and just changing it, changing it, changing it. And we need to uh, wipe the table and, and start again quite quite a lot. And the way to understand this is is very easy to understand. If you, what you get saved into frames your belief, and then right. from that day you're reforming that belief over and over again to be more like Christ, because church culture isn't like Christ. So you got framed into a culture that has benefits and costs. It wasn't king culture. <laughs> yes, you know. So. Um, so it wasn't the right culture, and then you have to look. That's your frame up to, and then you have to get new information, in which you see as heresy, <laughs> because the church, the particular church, we got saved into, and then you have to learn, learn, learn. And people will fight to stay bound. They're in a religion, but they put so much years into it. That's what they got saved into. It so it means the world to them. I got saved into this XXX church, whatever church it is, and it means the world to me. And I'll fight to stay in that culture. Not those people. People were good, but to stay in that belief system. So if you got saved into Catholicism in, let's say, you know, 500 years ago, still the same now, depends where you are, you might believe that you need to be under the Pope who has absolute succession. Uh, you need to go to the church. You need to confess your sin. and All unconfessed sin um, is held against you. And you have to go through purgatory to be purged of that sin when you die. Yeah. And you have to give money to the Pope and not eat fish on Fridays to honor Jesus. Yeah. And if you're not doing these things, you are in a bit of trouble. And but that's your salvation. Yeah. This stops you from burning forever in hell. So you hold on to this thing with everything. Yeah. And then some guy yeah. comes along, some German comes along and says, hey, all you have to do is believe that Jesus did it and it's done. And you have to, like, you're holding on to your Catholic belief and you have to, like, reach across. Is this true? <laughs> like, all I have to do is believe right there from here and you have to let go of the pageantry and the priest and confession and Mother Mary and the, the Hail Marys and the, and the yeah. penance and the whipping and the no food. And you leave all that just believing he did it. And you're risking, in your mind, you're risking eternal damnation to do this. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. You make the big move. And that might be the biggest thing you do your whole life. However, let's say you get saved into the Lutheran church. And they say you're saved by grace alone. And that's how you get saved, by, by believing you meet Christ that way. And someone says to you, yeah. hey, that's not true. You have to whip yourself. You have to fast on Fridays. You have to pray to a statue. You have to, you know, da, 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 da. You'd be like, what? No way. That's ridiculous. You're not going backwards, you know. And it's not the same person, depending on what building that they got saved into, what building they heard the gospel of Christ in, which is salvation. And they get framed into it. One person had a huge battle just to be the saved by grace, put into that building, and got from day one. They're never going to have to fight that battle. Right. And now you've got this little guy who got saved in Lutheranism and he's saved by grace. He's not going back to to all the sacraments and the rituals to keep his salvation up. He was saved by day one by faith. He's saved day two by faith. It's the same. He is good. Now someone says to him, hey, guess what? <laughs> the Holy Spirit can come upon you and you can perform signs, wonders, and miracles and prophesy. You're like, prophesy? You like you're a prophet, like from the Bible. Who do you think you are? He's no. The Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you can do that. And his church says, "Well, that's not true." And he has to leave that mm. church. We would now call this demonic. This is Satan, right? As always, every time you move this way, they call it Satan. So you move towards this. You experience the Holy Spirit. <laughs> is this real? Maybe get baptized, speak in tongues, etc. 
And then, you know, you have to, it's a big deal to leave your family. You know, maybe, maybe a fourth generation Lutheran. Your dad was a Lutheran pastor, you know, and you're leaving this our relationship with the Holy Spirit. Very difficult. Yeah. I think that's the that devil's babble, you know, whatever. And you go over there, right. you do that. It's been 50 minutes. But if you got saved in that building, you walk in, what's Christianity? You're worshiping Jesus. Holy Spirit falls upon you, receive Jesus, receive baptism, the Holy Spirit, you speak in tongues that day, you see someone's knee get healed, you say to that person, yeah. hey, hey, there's no Holy Spirit, you either go back this way, they be like, what? There's no Holy Spirit? I've met him. Like, it's like, you know, that's not saying my dad doesn't exist. I've met the Holy Spirit. Like, you can't yeah. do it that way. It's all could be the same right. person. It's just the building they're in. So everything gets turned up. So just know the Christian you're now living and me it's still something framed up and then reformed. We're trying to get closer and closer to the truth. And so don't be precious about many uh, cultural things, uh, church cultural things and church expression. And what you want to do is become a, uh, a mature son like your older brother Jesus. That's what it is. And it's nothing else. That's what Christianity is. Christ as you said, Christianity... Is the is the rest of becoming what you already are, and what you are yes. is a son of God. You're not a Christian. Christian is what the world calls us. Okay, pagans call us Christian. We invent the Correct. Christian, and it's a good thing. Am I a Christian? Yeah. As far as the world's concerned, I'm a Christian. But Jesus doesn't call me a Christian. God doesn't call me a Christian. <laughs> right? Yeah. He calls you son of God. Yeah. I am his son. I'm his beloved son. Him is well pleased. I want to become yes. his beloved son. He's well pleased. Listen to him. I'm on that process of maturity. So Christianity is not, when you become a Christian, you're not changing belief systems. Okay. It wasn't an atheist now Christian or a Buddhist now Christian or a traditional Christian now born again Christian. You're not changing belief systems. You're changing species. Okay, you were a human, and now you're a son of God. You were a human under Adam. Amen. And you're a son of God in Christ. Very different. Amen. Different class of being all together. Second uh, uh, Corinthians five seventeen. If you're in Christ, you're a new creation. What exists now never exists before. Yes. You're a class of being. The class of being is called a son of God. Which is not male; it's just the name of that class of being. So you can be God's little princess, yeah. <laughs> okay, you can be the bride of Christ. But the thing that is God's little princess, the thing that is the bride of Christ, you as an individual is a son of God. That's the class of being yes. you are amongst the angels and everything else. You are a son of God under the line of Christ. There's other sons of God, but Christ was uniquely begotten. Okay, and so you are under that line. They're created, okay? But you were created, but now eternal uncreated is part of you. And that's the difference. You are, with the, you are one with the uncreated eternal son. No other son of God, ben I Elohim, has that claim. <laughs> Only humans have that claim. Yeah. This body, this human shape can house and become one with Yahweh created God. And that's what you Amen. are. Amen. And that's the nature in you, the nature of the Son. So the nature of Jesus Christ has been given to you. And all it's doing is growing up like a seed grows into a full tree. This nature of the Son is growing the full stature of Christ in your lifetime in the body. And that's what needs to be preached because that's what every Christian <laughs> is doing because that's their DNA. That's their potential. That's the seed that's in them. The seed grows into a full tree. And all you need is good soil. And that's what we're doing being the good soil, that this tree will grow so you have the fruit of the Spirit, not works of the flesh, but fruit Amen. of the Spirit. Amen. Yeah. And that's what it is. And, so whatever and you're running for I in your particular denomination, that it Yes. Yeah, and I love also, Chris, that, that something you said one time really helped me also, that this new creation is identifying completely with the life of Christ, but it's the risen Christ. It's not just identifying with the, the first Adam God. back in the garden. Yeah. It's the second Adam, Christ. So to me, that's like, yeah. not only is there life, it's like a new 
upgrade. Like get that in your mind that it's not just the Christ that was dividing and, and, you know, making bread. And then it was like multiplying to the masses or was healing people. Not just that Christ, Christ that is the glorified risen Christ. That's who you're identified with. That's who you have the new life of. That's, that's even to me like, okay, wow. That's that's you know, that's what you receive. So Romans 6 says, don't you know that you were baptized into Christ's death? Baptized into Christ or baptized into his death? And the same power that rose Christ from the dead rises you from the dead so you can attain to the same resurrection life you had. No. So Jesus of Nazareth would be, would be pretty cool. <laughs> the risen, yeah. glorified, risen glorified Christ, where he walked through walls and, you know, all those things and the change of his appearance and that is the seed that you've been given, okay? You're not Christ. Christ was under the law with an undefeated Satan, okay? And still could be condemned under the law. We don't have that battle. <laughs> He's filled the law, defeated the enemy, but there's no condemnation. We are righteous forever. Yes. He has become our righteousness. So Christ is my righteousness. I don't have righteousness. As you know, um, Adam had righteousness. And he let it go, right? He listened to a word of another right. father. So he's not, and his righteousness was now based on works, the knowledge of good and evil, to know right and wrong, is to know the law, and that's his now his righteousness was based on his behaviour, which didn't go so well, as for neither of us, any of us to this day. So we believe in church that Jesus went down to hell, got Adam's righteousness, came back, and if you believe, he gives you your righteousness back. So you've got it back now, but be careful. Here's the laws to keep it. Keep it, and every church has different rules about if you kept your righteousness or not. Or not. But that is not how it works. You don't get Adam's righteousness right. back. It's gone. It's broken. It's, it's a shattered vase. It's never coming back. It's like it's gone. Okay. And what you don't, what you do instead, is you don't get Adam's righteousness back. You get the person of Jesus, and the person of Jesus Amen. is your righteousness. So you have the same right Amen. standing before God as Jesus does. And God is happy to see you as he is to see Jesus. And that's what yeah. you surrender to. That's the offense of Christianity. The day you believe Amen. is that the person of Christ makes his home with you and he is your righteousness. In fact, he is your salvation. You didn't get saved. You got Christ. And Christ Amen. is your salvation. And you have the fullness of Christ. Don't get half Christ or, you know, 10% Christ or a big starter pack Christ. You know, you get Christ. The person, yeah, who lives inside you. Yeah. And all you're doing is changing your mind, be transformed when you're in your mind, to believe what you already are. It's a rest. He who has entered yeah. Christ's rest has ceased from his strivings and his works. There's nothing to do except believe and delight in your union with Christ. And from there, this new creation, which is already righteous, my behavior and my thought and my life change. Yeah. So in Paul's yeah. letters, he will say, you're the righteous of Christ. You're raised and seated in heavenly places. You've got every spiritual blessing. Like God's happy with you. Like this is the new being that you are. Seeing that you're right. God loves you and you're raised and seated in his pleasure, change your ways because they've never done it before. And they're Greeks and Jews, but never done being a son of God before. This is how you change your behavior to love what you are. The church teaches, if you change your behavior, You'll be raised and see that in God will be pleased with you, which is no gospel at all. Yeah, it's, it's an order thing, right? You, you do this so that you get that, and it's an order thing. Instead of you've already got that, and so therefore you'll do this. It's coming out of you rather than to attain the very yeah. thing that you already are. It's, it's definitely an order, you know, and and we get the order wrong and shifted the wrong way in religion we get the order right and established in sonship. It, and it really is a difference. I mean, I've had people, when I let them know, because you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, and not just the righteousness of Rachel, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. So I am a saint. I'm not a sinner. And I'm telling you, I felt like some ladies were going to run me off the stage, right? And they went and they tattled on their on me to their pastor. And then the camp person came and I, and he's like, Rachel, I fully back you. You totally know. And I just said, I am, well, I'm so excited we have the one session because we have the opportunity to clear something up, but I'm backing down. And I just really good about saying, like, 
I need you to know that I can clear something up because I can read you some things from Romans 6. I can read you some things from 2 Corinthians. I can tell you, you have the ability to sin. That's the verb. But if you're in Christ, you're no longer the noun of sinner. And I said, you know, let's just do noun versus verb. And and what's really great is when you get pushback sometimes, the better thing is, is it establishes in you like you you have a weight in your gym and you have to push against it, makes you stronger. For me to have to push against it, it was like more more into like wanting to know exactly what God said about me. And like you've even helped with that. And so that's a beautiful thing because that gets more galvanized in you that no, this isn't a boastful comment. This is just making much of what God did in me. And so therefore, that's who I am. And I won't empty the cross of Christ. I will not say it in half. Nope, I'm not backing down, but let me clear something up. And I love that you bring yeah. that clarity. You know, it's the risen Christ as he is ministries, as he is, so are you in this world. And it's not one day. That, it's now. That's the gospel. I think the gospel is the power of God to salvation. So that's the gospel. If we don't preach that, we've got no power. <laughs> that's what Jesus did, so we're going to preach it anyway. I, um, I just, on my Facebook, I used to post little messages, like back in 2020, just little meme snippets, um, which is only to people who are listening to my messages. <laughs> and uh, some other church, some heresy church groups found it and started just screenshotting my stuff and putting it up on their site. and. They were like horrified, and um, what the one that just that just blew their mind is one I put in there is I've never met anyone more righteous than me. Oh, and they just like they could not comprehend. But I haven't met anyone more righteous than me. I'm the righteous of Christ. I met many people equally righteous. You are also the righteous of Christ. Day one yeah. Christian still struggling with many terrible behaviors, destructive behaviors, same righteousness as me. Because <laughs> Christ did his righteousness. Yep. And, met, and yep. Christ, same righteousness as me. Because <laughs> he gave it to me. Yep. Yep. So he's first. Right. He's always number one. We'll never be better than him. It, we'll be greater than him. He did it. And this thing that he did is given to us as a free gift through belief alone. And so, yeah. Uh, so there's lots yeah. of statements we can make, which are absolutely 100% gospel truth, and people will respond like heretical slash witchcraft behavior from you here. Yeah. No, I, I, I really believe that to be believed, I think this is your phrase, belief is God's love language. But literally, to be believed, is yeah. that good? Like. Chris, honestly, I, I remember yeah. deciding to I remember deciding to either reach out via Instagram or go to the website. I don't know. But I, I just felt like I would love to talk with Chris Blackaby. And then I almost hear you, is God that good? I'm like, yeah, God is that good to let Rachel have a conversation with somebody she wants because my God is that good. And even if he can't or he's busy, yeah. it won't make me feel less than. Does that make sense? It won't make me feel like, oh, you know, the real isn't any good. And you're, it was just like, is my God that good? I had a really difficult time for years when we didn't have contact with my daughter. And I mean, no contact for wow. seven years. But I just, and we saw her in the eighth year, but I kept saying to people, this isn't about the fact that God is going to answer my prayer. This is about the fact that God is good enough to make good on his promises, that he's a reconciler and a restorer, and he will restore the years the locusts have eaten, blah, blah, blah. My point is, and scripture's not blah, blah, blah. That's not what I meant. But I am saying that we have to decide how good God is. And you're one of the people that has helped me say, if he's that good, then he sort of responds to how you we're not shaping God, but we are saying God does respond to how we say he is. Because even during those years, if my daughter didn't want contact with me, then I had to kind of retreat like, okay. But God, I buried my treasure because I knew you were a terrible taskmaster and you're going to come back. God goes, okay. Or God, you left me out in the wilderness and, and here we are. And people are going to think you're dead. God does kind of go, okay. She really does believe this. Chris really does believe this. I can't wait to go in there and do this, whatever the this is, because it's how good he is. And we're kind of just 
establishing how good he is. So I just want to thank you because I know you've really helped me with that. So it's a big deal. How good is God? And is he good for you? Talk about that. What is it? The not you, not yet, that whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, if you know anything about my life, just know that everything I preach is what I struggled with, which is why I preach it, you know. So right. if I say look, God's good, that's because I did not believe God was good. <laughs> yeah. So everything I preach uh, is areas where I had to overcome and thought the opposite for many reasons. So, um, you know, I knew that God was good and true uh, and it was a healer and all these things, but he just wasn't that to me. You know, I felt like life was a bit like the Truman Show. Like, I felt like set up. I felt like God was good to many people and people and did things for people. And but just not for me. It's like an experiment, you know, <laughs> from from God. Like, what happens if I just ignore somebody for four years? Let's see what happens. You know, I really felt that way, even though I knew that couldn't be true. And uh, right, uh, that's that's religion. So religion says, uh, "Not you, not yet." And that's that's one of its cruelties. So the first thing is that it's not you, you know, and uh, like God's good. He's not good to you. Okay, God does this for people, but not you. Okay, and when you get over that through hearing the gospel and realize, hey, God is good to me. I am qualified through Christ for all the things uh, that He has. Everything is yes, and amen for me, and He already has given it to me. And the rest to receive these things, you know, you think, wow, that's great. And then the second cruelty was, well, but not yet. <laughs> you know. You can have it, not yet, you know. And we, our souls like that because unchallenged, mm. you know. Because if God doesn't answer prayer, what does that say about me? And it stirs up shame, and it stirs up doubt, it stirs, stirs up self uh, hatred, and all sorts of things. And uh, uh, so, if we put off to a future event that's never tested, we don't have to know. That God doesn't really like us. <laughs> and God loves me. Mm. But he doesn't like me. That's uh, that's the cruelty that religion will just leave you in this in this space, leave you in the desert, gets you, lets you get out of Egypt, but won't let you go into the promised land. You know? Right. So uh, we, we, revival is a great one because revival is coming. And it puts off this Christian life and this Christian behavior and this kingdom to a future event. That's dependent on God's sovereign move. So, hey, it's perfect. I can believe for this thing and nothing's required of me because it's up to God. <laughs> I can live my whole life without right. participating in the kingdom. God never brought revival. And religion, this, uh, not revival itself, which God, okay, but the idolatry of the hope of revival in replacement of becoming a mature son on the earth. It's like it's that yes. not yet thing. It's cruel. Uh, but your soul likes it. It's like, oh, yeah. Like, what did you do today? Oh, we prayed for revival. Well, high five. Great Christianity. You know, like, tick. What's your church? We believe for revival. <laughs> Cutting edge Christianity. <laughs> did you become like your yeah. father in heaven yeah. today? You know, walk like a mature son on the earth. You know, I prayed for revival, but I didn't pray for their enemies. That's what God's doing. Mm. God's not praying for revival. Mm. Jesus is not praying for revival. He is uh, contending before the courts of heaven, uh, pleading on behalf of the guilty. That's what he's doing, <laughs> you know. That's what yes. the mature son does. All mature uh, people like the father lay their life down on behalf of the guilty. They bless those who persecute them, pray for their enemies. Yeah. They die for, you know, someone may die for a good man, but no one's going to die for a wicked man. But this is love. But like, while we're yet sinners, God. Uh, Jesus died for us. That's your nature, you know. That not to die <laughs> for someone, but to love right. the people. You understand the great debt you've been forgiven. That your heart is you plead on behalf of the guilty. You know, um, uh, you know. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who persecute you. If you do these things, you'll be a true son of the Father. Who? sends rain on the good and the evil. There it is. <laughs> Jesus' works. <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. And so 
if you think of the church, do you think of the church as an organization that blesses those who curse it and prays for its enemies and sends rain on the good and evil, like the Father God? That's not what you think of. But that's the nature we've been given. That's who we've been coming. Jesus was the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. He laid his life down before evil began. And then right. anyone that started a patriarch movement, you know, uh, was tested on this matter. Because unless you lay your life down for the guilty, you can't govern, okay, in the era to come. You'll be there. You're not governing. Because you have to look like your father to govern what he's got, you know. And so Enoch, who started the uh, <laughs> crossing over thing, he pleaded on behalf of the fallen angels, okay? Yeah. He pleaded on behalf of the guilty. Uh, it didn't work, but he did it. <laughs> and then Abraham right. pleaded on behalf of Solomon and Gomorrah, on behalf of the guilty. Right. And then Moses went up the mountain. The Israelites are doing crazy stuff, messing up their DNA and all sorts of things down there. And God says, I'm done with Abraham's kids. I'm starting again. Moses is going to be the patriarch. There's going to be a new lineage through Moses. Okay, Moses and his sons or his twelve sons or whatever is going to happen. And uh, and Moses says, "Don't do that. Remove me from the book of life and keep Israel." Yeah. He said, "I mean, that's laying your life down. That's taking you behalf of the guilty." And then obviously mm -hmm. Jesus, yeah. uh, as the Lamb slain, came to earth. And he lays life down clearly, <laughs> that's the whole point, on behalf of the guilty, all humanity. He said, forgive them, Lord, they know not what they do. You know, he was meek I, because he had, he had the power to act and chose not to. You know, I called, sure. called down on these angels, but he didn't. When he died and resurrected, he wasn't like, right, revenge time. <laughs> you know, he went and cooked breakfast right. on the beach for those who betrayed him. He didn't go fine, he didn't rock up in Pilate's bedroom and go, Surprise! Like I'm back. Like you know, <laughs> do anything. You're so big and humble. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And then Paul says, "Yeah, um, I'd rather be written out of the book of life that Israel be saved, if that be possible." Yeah. In Romans, and now imagine uh, what it's like to be separated from God. You know, if you just had a little dimensional door here, and you can look into it, right? You can see what life and feel the pain of existence, being separated from God outside of time, you look in the door and, right? That's all you saw? Yeah. There is no way that you would exchange your, your name in the book of life to be rubbed out to exchange it for someone else's. No way. Like, you know, do you love Israel that much? Chris, would you... Be separated from me forever, Israel be saved. What's that like? Mm. No. <laughs> no way. Because that love is a miracle. It comes from somewhere else. You don't have that nature, but that love's inside me. Right. And, and I'm maturing that love. Okay. That person would do that. Mm. Is me. Because a man be, uh, be born of Christ, he's one spirit with the Lord. That is me. That's my spirit. Me and Christ have one spirit. Because well, God's put together, there's no men separate. I am Christ and me are one, and that's my nature. I lay my life down for the wicked. And uh, if so, this is my take on the matter, but it's uh, it, I think it illustrates yeah. the point. So first, this is the Bible, okay? And then I'll say when it's yeah, <laughs> okay. So Stephen, Act six, Act seven. Stephen's going around performing great signs, wonders, and miracles, and right. uh, he is a knockout dude, right? And um, he. Uh, Healing people, the, the the controlling religious party at the time is not very happy about that, and he tells them the whole history of Israel. Then he invokes death penalty by uh, saying, I, "I see the son near the father," and yeah. and then as they go to kill him, he says, "Forgive them, Lord; they know not what they do." Okay, he quotes his master Jesus, his older brother, and it says his face shone like an angel. Okay, right. which means he's trans. Right. right. And not an angel like a from Michelangelo, like a messenger from another dimension, heaven, the glory of heaven. His face shone like an angel. Okay, so he's transfiguring. Okay, he's transfiguring 
because his body and his soul now look like his spirit man, because his spirit man has the nature of the Father who lays his life down on behalf of the wicked. His message in his soul to do it. I'm going to lay my life down. Now, who lays his life down for? He lays his life down, I believe, for a man named Saul who was standing there holding jackets. Okay? Yes. So this is what I believe. This is what Chris speaking, not God. Stephen is going to be the great apostle to the Gentiles. This is, cool. this is his destiny on the earth. This is his record. And he's going to write many letters explaining the revelation of Christ to the Gentiles. And one morning he gets up and God said to him, there is a man named Saul. He hates you. He's going to hate Christianity. He's going to have a, such a wrath. He's going to go around and kill and destroy many of your friends. He's going to do it, no matter what. If I let him go, he's going to murder so many people and torture so many people. Would you lay down your life, your record as an apostle, your inheritance, your reward, your letters, your place in history, your destiny, your scroll? Would you lay it down and give it to him? to give him the opportunity to make a choice for me. And Stephen said, yes. He laid his life down. Like Jesus was a lamb slain before the foundation of the world, before evil began. Stephen laid his life down for Paul before the evil began. And he sowed that seed. And Paul has an incredible conversion. See? Save him. You know, in a court case and over that, like, <laughs> and uh, Stephen would, and he, Mother of the blood with a born testimony, bang. Paul gets a massive conversion. And Paul lives yeah. out the wreck of Stephen on the earth because Stephen lays life down on the behalf of the wicked. And we benefit from it in an amazing way. Right. Uh, yeah. And then, right. And then Paul, and of his life, says, I owe no man anything because <laughs> everything is of Christ. Yeah. So right. um, Stephen, Stephen is a mature son, okay? Son. He lays life down for the wicked. So, and so yeah. it was like Abraham, Abraham had to start a lineage, so that DNA was in him, so like to plead on behalf of the guilty. Moses brought in the law. He pleads on behalf of the guilty. Jesus brings in the new covenant. He pleads on behalf of the guilty, yeah. And Stephen launched... Uh, wherever Paul's ministry was, which is the most effective ministry to this day, <laughs> he lays life yeah. down on behalf of the guilty. When Paul says, yeah. I would lay my life down on behalf of the guilty. I would change my salvation for Israel's salvation, if that be possible. Yeah. yeah. And that's who you are. That, that nature's already inside yeah. you. It's Wait. amazing. It's a gift. Yeah. It is a gift. And I think sometimes we don't know that we have that until we know who we are. We don't know who we are until we continue to believe what God said we are. You know what I mean? There, you can kind of trace it all the way back to just being able yeah. to believe the the identity of it first before the purpose of anything else. And um, the gospel you know, this is a little bit of a different. This is a gospel is the power. This is a little bit of a different tact, but one of the things I'm grateful for is distinction okay first of all i i think it's funny when you're presenting how you sometimes just have a lot of fun with the audience but one one of the things that i love is how you, you talk about the difference between just being a son and knowing that god loves you and that you, you are loved and he's you're the object of his affection or you have ministry and so you'll put on like a jacket from like a lady in the audience and the jacket's too small for you. So it looks a little bit like a cape, you know, and, but the truth is ministry is good and God uses it, but it is for you to put on a jacket in a sense. And then you give that back to God and you're fully a son of God. And I just want you to clear that up because I know people that are in ministry and good. I have like things that I'm yeah. in ministry, but I tell you, even on Saturday, Chris, I had a time where I was in ministry and I'm the second speaker and I go out there, but I am telling you in my mind on that platform and I fall on, before I'm a fun, cause I love to make the audience laugh. That's just one of the things I am before I'm comedic before I'm, you know, somebody who runs around before I'm a person who loves the word of God before I'm somebody that prays over them. I'm a son of God. 
and that's who I am. And now I'm just going to put this jacket on and do the thing that God's created me to do. But it isn't why he likes me. And it isn't why he loves me. It isn't if I do this stuff for him, I will continue to get his approval. It's just because I have it that I almost go, okay, here we go, dad. And I go. So can you just talk about a little bit about ministry? Because it's there so that everybody can become a mature son. I hope I didn't yeah, say more. That's right. But just but kind of tell us a little bit no, about that. that because people, they own too much yeah. of the ministry when you should, but it is also not what makes you a son. Yeah. Exactly. So the only game in town <laughs> is being a son of God. There is nothing else. Okay. And we've never been a son of God before. And so we need help. And the way we get help is gifts, gift of the spirit and ministry gifts. We're not walking in the maturity of a son. We're not love yet. Okay. Because right. love replaces all the gifts. Okay. Um, so we're not there yet. So we have gifts. And these gifts are a, a, a jacket that comes down from heaven, okay? Comes down <laughs> and and sits on us like this. And now yes. I'm a dude, okay? But I can't prophesy over anyone because I can't see because I don't love them. I wouldn't lay my life down for them. So God's not going to reveal their life to me because I don't love them, okay? But I, we need to start to learn how. So in the same way uh, you learn to ride a bike, you get training wheels, okay? So you've got the little training wheels on the side. So now you're riding a bike. You're not really riding a bike, but you are riding a bike. You're not, are you a bike rider? Yes. But, not, but no, but yes, you know. And then eventually the training wheels have to come off. You get a little bit worse. Right. But then you're riding a bike, okay? So gifts of the Spirit, before I say this, your gifts of the Spirit come upon me, and now I have a gift of faith or healing, and I can heal somebody. Now, Son of God can heal out of his own nature, but I've never done that before. I've never seen it. I don't believe it. So a gift comes upon me, and now I see people healed. You know, so I'm riding my bike with my training wheels on. Eventually, God says, okay, now I want you to love them and do it from your nature, not from the jacket. Because when I get to heaven, this jacket goes. <laughs> it's just me. This is what God's interested in, this, this thing here, not my jacket. Jackets are temporary for the right. earth. They won't be there in the next era. You're not a healer in the next era. Healing what? <laughs> you know, evangelist in the next era. Evangelizing what? The same thing works for ministry. So I'm a dude. I'm a Christian. I'm born again. I'm a son of God. And God has a call in my life. He says, will you feed my sheep? You know, or will you pass it? And then down comes this gift. And this says 10,000 people will follow you. Written on this jacket. And everything, all the angels see it. All the demons see it. It controls the local council. I want to build a big building here. The council gets that way. I have this amazing favor because it's all written on my jacket. When I get this 10,000 people that will listen to me, I start a Bible college. I start a young business group. I start a young marriage group. I do a food kitchen. I've got a jail ministry because this jacket just makes it happen and draws the right people to me. I guess I think that the way it's all written on here. Okay. And so, and I've got multi sites going on and an online ministry. I get to heaven. I've done really well. And God says, welcome, Chris. Got my jacket back, please. And your jacket goes. Okay. And there goes your 10,000 seated church and everything like that. And it's just me. And God says, do you look like me? Because that's who governs the next era. That's the maturity and the reward of the next era. Did you stop the children? Did you bless your enemies? Were you meek? Did you, could you have acted? in wrath and chose not to and took the hit. Right. You know, that's what I would do. <laughs> right. Did you confront religion? Did you side on behalf of the poor? Did you defend the widow? Did you work against injustice? Like these things. And i will be like going through my receipts like, mm, uh-huh. you know, like because <laughs> if I got my, my if I got my um, satisfaction from that jacket, then my reward's on the earth, which is fine. Okay, because a, a gift is just like a hammer, right? It's just a just a hammer. Let's say this is a hammer. Yes. And yes, I can use it to yes. build a house, or I can use it to break someone's legs. You know, I can prefer yep. a gift. I can build their house. I can break their legs with it. You know, and so they're just jackets, but they come off. The way you want to change yes. is the nature of this being. 
redemption of the body that I hoped which we were called. We will need to change this body, change your heart, change it with soul, your mind, whatever, and then your body changes. You want to become like Christ, spirit, soul, and body, like Stephen, who transfigured, which is to be like God's spirit, soul, and body, because your soul and your body look like your spirit man now, you know? And that's love. Yes. And that kind of love, you can't bring it up. <laughs> it's a right, gift right. of a person right. of that nature. And there's a delight in that. And you say, okay, God, I want to be a mature son. Take me on this path. And he's like, well, see the cost before building a tower. Do you really want to be a son of God in the body? Because everything about your soul and your body wants safety and security and to live. To become a son of God, you need to lay your life down and take up my higher life. And you belong to another. You do it to see the father doing. I'm like, oh, mm, some days, <laughs> you know, not every day, a couple of days off a week. Yeah. But uh, God will yeah. take you on that journey. If you tell him, he knows your heart and he will take you on that journey. And uh, you imagine what America would be like if the church prayed on behalf of Obama for eight years. We just yeah. loved, we loved him, held him in our heart and said, Father, forgive him. He knows what he do. And forgive this Hillary Clinton lady and forgive this person and may they know you speak to them during the night. May they remember the promises they made you as a child. Yep. Like, you know, uh, open their eyes to the truth, uh, hide their sin. May they walk in the full statue of Christ in their lifetime. And the church got together and just yeah. pleaded and prayed on behalf of the whole Democratic Party. Yep. We have a different yep. nation. <laughs> yep. We didn't. We're not or, sons or, of God. Or, or. We're Christians. And he yeah, right. And and he gave us that model, you know, he said that. Right, right. And we fall into the pattern of what we're so used to rather than the the actual template and prototype of who is within us to act out those very things that we don't do or are made to do, but maybe don't practice. Yeah. Because, you know, it says in scripture that you would pray for your leaders. And this isn't the only reason, but that you would have peaceful lives. You know what I mean? Like there is even a benefit for us when we really do pray for those in authority over us. I and mean, it's, it's really a smart thing to do. Uh, Let's pause a second. If you are enjoying The Real Deal with Rachel in a way, subscribe, rate, and review it. I appreciate your support. All right, back to The Real Deal. Just one example, since this is The Real Deal, of some things that shaped you to be the Chris you are as the son of God. I know some things about provision. I know some things about sickness and illness and having to overcome some things or even stories where you didn't think God would provide, but he provided or just one thing that comes to your mind of when God, when you encountered God in a very fatherly way or a way that propelled you into the next part of you trusting him is I guess what I want. Just because I think any of those things are part of the real deal in Chris's life where he shows up for you or he is exactly who he says he is and he introduces himself in scripture and then you go yep i'll never doubt this or i'm trying not to doubt this anymore because he did show up or whatever i i don't exactly know what i'm asking except for i think that when we have a testimony of something that's happened to chris blackaby it's important for other people here yeah look there's there, there are two main ways that really uh shocked me and uh, I realized this is real. And uh, one is in provision when God provided for me when I wasn't actually producing, because I've been in church my whole life and in certain forms of ministry my whole life. When I stopped doing that, uh, his goodness didn't stop. And this is true. I was so, I was in Israel. <laughs> oh, well, that's a story. It had to be in Israel. I was in Israel and I was dying. I was really ill and um, and I wasn't in ministry. I left ministry and I thought I'd messed it up. I was just going to die and then find what I did wrong. That was my whole understanding at the time. So I'm just going to, because the Bible's true, God's true. So obviously I'm the problem here. I've tried for 30 years to get this right. I don't know. I've asked, I've prayed, I've sought counsel. On everything, and now I'm dying. <laughs> this is not the results I wanted. And uh, right. I was in Israel, 
And uh, I didn't know what to do because I Israel was traveling. I thought I'd die before I actually got to Israel. Uh, my accommodation, like the night before, because like, oh, I'm going to Israel tomorrow. Bought these tickets, <laughs> the world ticket. I mean, Israel. Okay. And uh, I was doing nothing for God. I wasn't reading the Bible. wasn't praying. Definitely wasn't giving God any money. <laughs> like, there was nothing going on. Yeah. I was going to coast out this last week or two weeks or months, or whatever. And God just kept being good to me. And then in Israel, he was very good to me. And um, the bishop, I was staying at this place, and this lady was there, and she just looked, she looked really stressed. I just arrived. And she's and I said to her, "Hey, you okay?" She's like, "I started a travel agency, <laughs> and my first customer is the bishop of is it Kenya, and the uh, chief magistrate of Kenya, and all their crew. So uh, she had uh, a mayor, uh, a magistrate, and she was freaking out. I said, "Well, look, I've got a nice camera. Like, I'll take some photos. You can use them for promotion." And she was like, because Israel's tough, right? No one. Yeah. It's not it's a very difficult place to be. And no one helps no one. <laughs> and I wake up in the morning. I got down for breakfast. And she's like, oh, the, the, the bishop would like you me to be his photographer. And the bishop wants me to be his photographer to go with him wherever he went. So I got a full security guided tour of Jerusalem, <laughs> I haven't booked anything. Do you think I was even going to be alive? Okay, of Jerusalem. Yeah. I saw all of Jerusalem, the tunnels underneath, uh, that opened up places for us that were closed, you know, into churches yeah. with everyone cleared out. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was amazing. And then um, I just got back on bed and I woke up, thought it was good. I didn't like God being good to me because I actually thought he was being Good to me, so I'd go back to being a pastor. That's what I thought. Oh. I thought it was a trick. This is where my relationship was. This is 2006. And um, about October, two, September, October 2006. And then uh, I got up in the morning. I thought, I'm just going to talk to the first person I see and see how they're going. Like like I did the last time, I'd lay with a, with a camera. And I wake yeah. up, I talk to this lady. Anyway, she's part of a Bible smuggling crew that she was like 75 and she goes to non stop the 75 year old lady. She tell me all these crazy stories. So, anyway, uh, the Bible college is going down south on the archaeology, ar- archaeology tour. Would you like to join them? I'm like, yeah. And they just put me on this bus with all these uh, post grad Bible theological slash archaeology students. I took me all the tour of the south, gone to all these places, places unlocked to me, you know, all done. And I got back. <laughs> I thought, ah. remember, I'm doing nothing. I'm angry with God and I'm doing nothing for him. Okay, I'm angry. Right. I'm doing nothing. I thought, he's just trying to get me back into being a pastor. This is how I thought, how God was. <laughs> I wake up next morning and I, I saw this guy and he was sitting there by himself. I thought, hey, you okay? He goes, oh, he says, I've just been told by my employer I have to go do something. Uh, yeah, I don't want to do it, but I have to do it. I said, what's that? He goes, well, um, there's been the rockets. This is back in 06, uh, coming over to yeah, damage that- things. And I have to go investigate the whole north of Israel and make sure it's still safe. Mm-hmm. I said, oh, I've never been this. Would you like to come with me? I go, yes. So I go to a guy, and he takes big buses around. It was just me and him. And he drove all around Galilee into the kibbutzes and, and all the other places up to Golden Heights. He had to go check it wasn't damaged. <laughs> so I got three yeah. free tours of Jerusalem, the south and the north. And then after yes. the rise, and I was, waiting for, I was waiting for the shoe to drop. You know, for me to have to go home or me to have to start tithing. But it never happened. <laughs> yeah. I realized, wow, yeah. that's just God's nature. And what I actually realized... <laughs> is God had all these things he wanted to give me. And I was working hard for him. He couldn't give them to me because it would reinforce my hard work for him. Not from, but yep. for. If he yep. gave it to me, it would yep. reinforce it. And then when people, and I was a pastor, so when people came to me, why is God so good to you? I'd tell them why. Because I go to prayer meeting, because I give 
apostolically and to the poor and I tithe and I've got gifts and I'm doing the five envelopes and all these things like the building fund. <laughs> you know, that's why it got yep. good to me. I, I somehow subconsciously attach it to my behavior. So God took right. me to a place not was not thing, I resented doing anything. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. I resented deeply. There there was and, no um, way to tie it back to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, my attitude was bad. And secondly, uh in twenty ten I got healed and God healed me when I was ungrateful and angry, so like four years later from that, so I was still sick the whole time. Mm-hmm. And I told God, I said, look, if you heal me, I'm either going to die or you're going to heal me. And either way, I'm not happy. I'm like, if I die, I'd be like, well, thanks, bro. If you heal me, I'd be like, well, you could have done that 20 years ago. Like, yeah, there's this is a lose lose situation. I cannot even understand your behavior, right? <laughs> so I was unhappy. And so if you heal me, I won't be grateful. I'll just be annoyed that you wasted 30 years of my life. That's mm. how I, <laughs> and I explained it to God. <laughs> He's the parable. I said, imagine you're walking along a jetty or a pier, whatever you call them here, and you fall off the edge yeah. of the pier, of the jetty. The boardwalk, whatever, and you fall into the yes. ocean, and it's freezing cold, and you're fully clothed, and you go down, okay, and you come up, <gasps> you go down, you come up, <gasps> and, and like you're dr- you're in trouble, you could die, and then you come on time, and you see someone walk up, and you see their shoes at the very edge, you go, oh, I'm saved, yeah. you got, and they can save you, got, you go grab them, and they don't, you go, oh, they must have missed me, you go up one more time, <gasps> you go up, and they don't grab you, you go, oh, maybe they couldn't reach me, and um, maybe there's something wrong, and you go, I've got one more shot. This okay, up, sure. get up to reach them, and they don't pull you out. And then you do that for 30 years, mm-hmm. and then after 30 years, the guy reaches down and pulls you out. What do you say to that guy? <laughs> That's what I say to you <laughs> if you heal me. I'm like, no, oh, I've been drowned for 30 years, then you reach down and pull me out. Well, thanks for nothing, you know. Anyway, he did heal me quite dramatically, like, like almost movie style or dramatic. Like, I was so sick I couldn't leave the house. And then an hour later, I was, like, running. <laughs> like, I had to run. I wow. was like, run. I was like, well, good. I don't know what to say to you. I really don't know what to say. So I wasn't grateful beforehand. I wasn't grateful after. He healed me. <laughs> that had nothing to do with my attitude or my earning or my behavior. He was doing his nature. And uh, what I did believe uh, is that he did do it. And uh, I was really sick. And I was listening to a a Texan preacher called Curry Blake, who's who's John G. Lake's continuation of John G. Lake's ministry, and rightly so. Okay. And um, he was telling, um, he was saying, like, if if you're forgiven, they're healed. And, like, you know, he just proved it over and over again that Jesus already healed you. It's God's will, will to heal. I was like, well, I just don't get it. I hear it and hear it and hear it. And I believe I'm healed, but I'm not. So once again, there's something wrong about me. It's something faulty about me. Like, why doesn't it work for me? It works for other people. And all these testimonies and stuff like this, you know. And uh, when you're really sick, like, being healed is the only game in town because you can't get out of bed. It's not like you can do something else. You can't do anything else. Right. You'll get healed before you do anything else. You can't even read the Bible. You can't do anything. You can't. You couldn't do anything even if you wanted to. It's gone so far that works without the question. <laughs> and, uh, right. and then I heard Curry Black say, hey, I would die believing I was healed because Jesus did it. Mm. Like had his whip, he, he, if he just had his back ripped open by his stripes, I'm healed. Like he did that for me. And that's a fact. That, and like, I won't take that from him. And all of a sudden, I realized, hang on, I can die believing. But that was the big thing. I thought I didn't believe because I wasn't healed. Mm. When he said that, I realized, actually, I do believe. I do believe Jesus had his back ripped open for me and then went to the cross and and the crown of thorns and everything. And 
I actually believe he did that for me. Like, he would do that for me. Like, that was a big thing that he would, because I had the thing, because it wasn't healing me. It's like, not you, not yet. Like, it was not you. <laughs> and then if I did believe it, it's, well, not yet. And that broke it for me. It's like, wow. I realized that I, that, that I actually believed. And that yes. he did what, and I, if I died, um, or if I'm getting worse, uh, it doesn't change the fact that Jesus did do that for me. And I'm not going to take that from him. It became a reality to me. And uh, that is when, like, healing entered my body. Because I heard a word. Yes. I didn't fast or do anything. I heard a word. But my attitude was still the same. I was still angry beforehand, still angry afterwards. <laughs> but the gospel is the power of the salvation. And the gospel did its work despite my ingratitude and accusations and everything else. <laughs> the gospel just did its work despite me. Amen. And so Amen. not to spite me, despite me. <laughs> yes. Yes. I don't know yes. What my accent sounds like. Yes. <laughs> e -E -S, yes. Despite me. And um, so uh, so in that way, um, I think that sort of answers the question when I realized that God's goodness to me is completely separate to my behavior or attitude or capacity to understand or even capacity to believe even, you know, theological constructs. It's based on would he do that? Yeah. Yeah. Is he the type of God that would do that? It's, do you believe his character? You make a call on his character. And I made a call on God's character is that, no, Jesus did do that for me, you know. And I didn't drum it up. The word came and the word could contain the faith of itself that needed to be there, you know. I heard the foolishness of preaching. I heard Curry Blake say something. And in those words, the faith to change my mind, you know. Yes, yes. So, yeah. And, and there's definitely like a before and after because of it. You, you know what I mean? Like, and not dependent on you. Oh, that was, and I was quite that, Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I'm really so glad you shared that, Chris, because not only is it profound, it really releases anybody that you can believe and not have to be tied to your behavior because God doesn't want it to be that. It's based on his promises, his behavior, his son, all of those things, which I think is so freeing and it really is the good news. It's really the good news. And like you say, it's very different than construction. You know. It's not it's good instruction, good. it's good news. Yeah. And good instruction Much is better. good instruction. Paul gives a lot of good instruction, but it's yep. completely separate from the good news. As in right. the constant the good news is the good news. And uh seeing yeah. the good news, here is some good instruction. But the gospel's the power of salvation. Absolutely. And that's why he's so angry Amen. with Galatians. He wasn't angry. He was angry with the Corinthians, but God said, you can only build them up, not tear them down. <laughs> and they were right. very naughty. They were doing awful things, getting drunk, suing each other, doing other things with each other. Okay, they were naughty people. And they got the gifts. Sign, right. wonders, miracles. I remember because I, they still received the gospel. Right. They weren't following good instruction, right. but they had the gospel. And right. Galatians very well behaved. And Paul was furious with them. He says, you know, castrate yourself, you're bewitched. Who's preaching this gospel? May they be wiped out. You know, you've gone to works rather than belief. You've gone to behavior right. over belief, which is no gospel at all. Right. Christ died for nothing, he's telling you. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's and it, good behavior is good. Yes. Make no mistake. Bad behavior is throw your ring. But it's the you know, the cart for the horse, you know, like the, the, the wrong way around. Yes. Being who you are, let this new nature come through you. And sometimes you need that framed up because you've never done it before. So, you know, in those days, so don't don't drink the blood of live animals, you know, like don't because they're doing all this, you know. You don't need to do that anymore. And you look after the poor now and like this framing it up yeah. for you. And you have to honor your partner, your marriage partner. Men on women and women on men. Like it's framing up this this new world for them that they're, to get out of their culture. 
that was secondary. Right. It's a response. Right. It's good instruction. Yeah. Be- but the good news is, is the because good news. of this. It, because of this, this is borne out. Instead, of, I, I think yeah. it's a big time order thing for sure. For sure. I mean, even when scripture says you keep in step with the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, whereas religion or whatever will say, don't gratify the desires of the flesh. And that will be a way to keep in step with the spirit. It's an order. It's an order thing. And I yeah. even caught myself the other day talking to somebody about something like I swear I'm influenced by you because I said, and they were the naughty church. I said, ex- I said what I think you would have said. And I just, I caught myself being like, oh, that that's such a Chris Blackaby comment. But, you know, it's really true. It's really true. They still, because of the goodness of God, he can't stop being God. So he still will give them. And, you know, it's his kindness that leads to repentance. It's the way that, like, he's so full on good. He gives Peter all these fish. And then he's like, my Lord, my God. It's like he doesn't stop. And it's not because Peter does all the right things or Rachel does all the right things or Chris does all the right things. It's because it's his nature and he's good. Okay. I could talk to you forever. I have one last thought. And then I want for you, if you're willing to pray or lead us through an exercise, whatever. And I want to just pray for you and close. But I think you've said something. I'm a prayer person. I have received prayer. I love to pray for people. I love to intercede. But talk about if, if you believed God for everything he said, what would it do your prayer, your prayer life? You kind of talk about this because it's important that we realize if every promise were true, which it is, and if you did everything God tells you to do, like just talk about that because I think that's important because some of the people that follow me are going to know the importance of prayer. But I think it frames it to be more thankful than just asking all the time. Yeah, yeah. So um, prayer is really with God and you're sharing your life with him and you talk about your fears and your faiths. Like you can have a relationship with him and all these things like this. But uh, the content and the need of prayers will change when you understand the gospel so jesus said it's better that i leave as a church we don't really believe that because we want jesus to be here <laughs> to win the argument you know unless we need jesus like jesus i need you we need him to be here in the body still in jerusalem so we fly in get our ticket and have our 20 minutes for jesus and he can lay his hands on us and solve them okay because we want the body of jesus here we want this we want him physically here to mm. hug us and hold us i understand that I want to see him, but God wants us to be spirit beings, and spirit be- beings believe a word. That's how we live. Yeah, and He wants us to grow up and be like Christ. If Christ wasn't He was still here, we would never grow up. If you still did everything for your daughter, she would never do it herself. You know, and if you keep doing everything for your fifteen-year-old daughter that you did when she was five, she'd still be five. You know, in some areas. Yeah, you know, if you drove yep. everywhere, she never got a license. You drove everywhere. And it's the same thing. It's better that you left. That spirit can reside within us, that we grow up and become the fullness of the stature of Christ. So, if you, uh, I'd like to do this one day, <laughs> go in front of a church and say, okay, tell me everything you'd like Jesus to do for you, you know, and then everything you think the, you'd like the pastor to do for you, okay? Right. That's what you ought to do. You're supposed to do what the pastor's doing. He's just there to build you up to that place. You should be visiting yep. the sick. Guess what? <laughs> you, know, you should be reading the word. Well, guess what? And everything we to do, that's even more offensive. People get to that. We'd like him to end world hunger. Guess what? We'd like him to stop the earthquakes. Guess what? We hear the redeemed creation. Everything you're asking God to do, he wants you to grow up and do it yourself in time. So when you're a little kid, you get shoes put on you. Then later on, you know, <laughs> then you can choose your shoes, you know, eventually buy your own shoes, like you mature. Yeah. Yes. And God's like, I want you to look after the earth. And at the moment, we're like, God, you know, why is there suffering and famine in the world? And eventually, God's like, hey, you're five years old, find your own shoes, or you're 15 years old. Like, it's like, God, why is there earthquake and famine? And God's like, Chris. Why is it earthquakes and famine? Yeah. Heaven's, the highest heavens belong to me, but earth have given to me. You're here yes. to govern the earth, grow up and become like me, the fullness of the stature of Christ. This is what you're doing. So it's better they lived. And then you see, once you understand this, you see all through Scripture and the New Testament that that's exactly what he wants. 
He's given us everything we need. He said earlier, life, capital L, in my mind, the life and godliness, being like God. Okay, to grow up and be the, the full, risen, mature, glorified Christ in the body, and that so we mm. can all the creations yearning, the manifestation of the sons of God. That's us, and the redemption of the body, so we can re- remove the frustration from creation and from our own. Yes. Body. Okay, so this creation is waiting for the glory of the sons of God, not of Jesus Christ. It's not waiting for Jesus creation. Not waiting for Jesus to come back. It's waiting for us to grow up. And so is the cosmos, Amen. really. It's for us to grow up and take our place on, on, on Christ's throne with him eventually, hopefully. And uh, so as you see that, uh, you realise that a lot of things we're asking God to do, he's asked us to do. Yes. And uh, so if you stop asking God to do what he's already done and you stop asking God to do what he's asked you to do, then lots of your prayer life will be over. Yeah. yeah. You can ask him to teach you. Show me how, show me how to be a son in this rather than, hey, mum, can you make me an omelette? It's like, hey, mum, can you show me how to make omelettes? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You, you, want, you want to grow up and take your part in the household. You want respons- maturity is responsibility. Will you willingly, voluntarily take on responsibility? And then, you know, it's just like a kid. Like, I want to do it, actually. <laughs> Bro, you're three. You can't put gas on the fire. Okay, that's the job. Okay, but I want to do it. And then other times, you're too far behind. Like this is just the human way. We're just big kids, you know. That that human nature is the same. You know? we're like, God, I want to govern a galaxy, or you know, I'll revive this city. You're like, yeah. That's like you cannot do that. You'll destroy it in yourself. You're like, but I want to do it. You know, I want to drive the car. And other times it's like, um, you, we're, we're behind, you know, because like, Hey, you know, God, can you do this? God, like, Hey, uh, that's your job. Now you're three, you're seven, you're 12, you're 19, you're 35, whatever. Like it's, it's, it's a metaphor. Yeah. You are right. Everything you want me to do eventually, I want you to do it. Yep. And, uh, if you're on that path, and you then you ask God to father you into it because Christianity is the process of being fathered, sired, reproduced, uh, the nature of God, of your father, to grow up to look exactly like him. You'll never be greater than your teacher, it's enough to become exactly like him. Like Put on the new man that's created to be like God. I yearn yeah. until Christ is fully formed within you. You know, be conformed to the exact image of Christ. Everything you need for life and godliness, every spiritual blessing, every prayer is yes and amen. The grow up, the fivefold ministry are there until you reach the fullness of the stature of Christ. So that's what it's supposed to do. And that's what the fivefold ministry is supposed to do. So I'm not going to comment on on the success of that, but <laughs> that's what it's there for. I don't know what we're using it for. Maybe to build ministry. Yeah. But it's there to build the saints to the fullness of the stature of Christ. The saints, not the ministers, the saints. Everyone. It, exactly. That's what. Exactly. And, and that's, that's, it's almost like the role of a coach in a sense, you know, or running drills or something where, you know, there's a reason why I'm here, but it's so that you will get in the game and play the game, so to speak, not the game, but you, you know what I mean? It's an important yeah. role, but it's to work yourself out of that very role yeah. because everybody will do it. I mean, when my kids were little, we would excuse ourselves from the table and one visiting family were like, you guys got these guys down to robots. I didn't mean that, but somebody knew what their role was to load the dishwasher. Somebody would sweep the floor. Somebody else would clean off the table because it was like, I'm not the only one that's mom and needs to do this. We all can take our part. And it's, it's the same when we grow up to be mature sons, we will no longer need those fivefold. It doesn't mean they were, didn't have a serve, didn't serve a purpose or aren't needed, but they're not needed to the same extent or for the same duration at all anymore. Hopefully work yourself out of a job like a parent would. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely. You want your kids to take over the fair business. Yes. You know? And you want them to grow up you know, all the roles and then you want them to make their decisions eventually. It's like, shall we expand into this market? You decide. It really is. Adam and Eve were to express their nature, their desire of their heart to how Eden and that should have looked and make the whole earth, maybe the whole cosmos eventually. 
and that's up. Yeah. Like when, when we that's knew, awesome. we asked God for everything. What we do here? What do we do there? Because we've never done it before. And as we grow up, we'll say, okay, what do you want the city to look like? What do you want nature to look like? What do you want technology to look like? And uh, but we're back right out of that, waiting for revival or rapture or to die and go to heaven, which is uh, the yeah. whole no, not you yet situation, just framed in very aspirational spiritual terms. But uh, right, it's kingdom is here now. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You and now instead of not you and not yet, you and now. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's such a good. Thing. But, but now, now is just where you are at in your maturity, and you just have to accept that. Like a seven-year-old has to accept that he can do some things around the house, but you can't use the guns. You know, like that's okay. You know, <laughs> just, because God doesn't He doesn't keep things from you. He keeps things you know for you. Like you know, yes. if you had anger and revenge in your heart, and then. He gave you miraculous power. Well, you would damage some things, whatever, with your free will with that miraculous power. We must, right. the only tra trajectory is to become love. Yeah, that's it. And love the is like peace, joy, peace, understanding, all that comes with wisdom, uh, counsel, might, all those things are all there to build you. Or change you transform you into love your true nature and the litmus test in creation is we lay life down for the wicked and for me the answer is no like I, no. <laughs> okay yeah. That's, yeah. Not my job. that's god's job and i'm moving that way that's already inside me i can't make it happen it's like jesus raised the bar to impossible levels because the law religion yeah. Let you do what you can do on your best day, okay? So you can do it. You can't do it five days in a row, and now you know you could have done it, so you condemn yourself, which is to make it impossible. If you're angry, you're a murderer. You know, like, be perfect, but your father heaven isn't perfect. You know, turn the other cheek. Impossible. <laughs> so he gave you that nature himself. And yes. so, Christian, yes. it's it, it's only be received. There has to be a rest because there's nothing you can do except respond. And be fathered into yes. the nature that you are. I mean, you know, as a child, you're like, hey, no, you, you can do this. Like, you do, you do have the ability to ride a bike. You know, we can take the training wheels off today. You know, kids are like, no, no, no. Like, yeah, no, I know you can, you know, and that's what God's like. But what he's, he's not bringing you into ministries or capacities as such, he wants to change your nature. But we love ministries right. and capacities where God only right. judges the heart. Right, right. Yeah, it's so, it's so true, and it's so like exciting, and also um, there's always there's always the more like there's always the maturing process. So there's a, always a new area for you to embrace or believe that you really already have it. And even like yes. within a family, the older sibling may be able to do something more than the younger sibling, and so the younger one can't compare or compete with them because it's like the parent has given that responsibility or given that freedom. Because they have the ability and have proven certain things, not out of just behavior, but I do think that helps us free, be free to be his kids. And he will treat us and do different things. Absolutely. Ask certain people to do certain things. Because if we're always comparing or trying to compete with one, we don't, we're not having enough time to be who God made us be anyway. And so there's a great freedom Every to just be his kid. Every child must go the way they should go. It's that yes. Each child is different. You know, yes. and some children are just mega talented, and other children are not <laughs> in real life. Yeah, you know, I there's some areas of my life where I am not talented, <laughs> but yeah, you, you, you give them the counts the trust you were given. That's it. Don't bury your one gift in the ground because mm -hmm. someone has two. You know, that's evil. That's perverse. God says you. Everyone yeah. is here on the earth to reveal an aspect of the multifaceted wisdom of God to creation and the fallen angels. Preach. That's what you're doing. And you, you said yes to it. Whatever your thing is. Yeah. And just do your thing. Because if it's a Amen. gift and you're looking after some kids in some backwater town 
and God says, you look like me. Here's 10 cities. Yeah? Yeah, yep. That's it. He's given the count. You know, the that's, your, that's, that's it. Right. That's really my heart, Chris. You've kind of hit on my heart. Like for me to always encourage people, it's to encourage them not to be me, but to be them. Because, you know, like the tagline of this particular podcast is Rachel in a way, helping people celebrate their significance and the genius of God in them. And so, like yes. you said, if you have a mercy gift, that's your gift. And you do that thing. Stay, stay in your lane and do it unto God and do it with full passion and fervor because he created you to do it and he delights when you do and it's a beautiful thing and when you're not fully who you are or what he's equipped you to do then you're you're kind of always trying to look in somebody else's lane to do that and he's like oh rat really wanted you to be you and so if we're masterpieces if we're his workmanship if we're poems of god that he creates in advance for us to do those things i think it's kind of a beautiful setup to cooperate with god and fully be you that's part of the real deal is like kind of unlocking like People, be you and watch God do what he needs to do in you. So anyway, you just hit on a real passion of mine because that is for sure part of how I'm wired. And, and what I really believe is that God wants us to fully embrace that and be it. So, yay. <laughs> yeah. Yay. Yep. That's all. You only do what you're the Father doing. That's it, you know. And uh, there's w real wisdom. That's what you give account to, what you're asked to do. And it's more, yes. you know, was I asked around the Lord? Well, it's not so much that. It's, it's the who you become and the, and the aspect of God's nature you bring to the earth. That's bringing heaven to earth. And that's for you to do. If you do that through running a multi-million dollar company or you do it through looking after um, your, your grandchildren and, um, you know, whatever it is, you just do what God asks you to do. That's it. And, um, and those who have will be given more. And those who don't have, even what they have will be taken away from them. Brutal. That's yeah. to our thinking. Brutal. That's the kingdom. So uh, if you've kingdom. got one thing, do your one thing. Because you'll be, Amen. you know, then, then you do your one thing. God will say, wow, 10 cities. You call me good with your one thing. You're grateful and call me good. And, uh, yeah, you know. Well, how we judge success from the outside is not how God judges success. If exactly. Save um, seven, save three billion people, and you only save seven hundred fifty million. <laughs> you didn't do what I asked him to do. <laughs> In fact, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm, just, I'm being, I'm being like, I'm accelerating to prove the point. Do you know yeah. Billy Graham at, at the end of his life? I didn't what God asked me to do. This is his honest take of his ministry. And the interviewer asked mm. him, what did God ask you to do? He said, I was supposed to raise 12 sons. But I didn't. I did ministry instead. Mm. And this is, no, his, this is his take. I raised my own son. He said, I've missed that now. He says, my gift died with me. I didn't do what God asked me to do. Mm. And uh, R.T. Kendall says the same thing. Wow. He's still alive now, R.T. Kendall, and he's still the same thing. These are dignified, amazing men with no disgrace in their life, you know, written books, changed right. names of people, literally. And both of them, as older men, said, I missed it. I did ministry, but I wasn't a father. And God asked me to raise children. I didn't. I did ministry. So just do what God asks you to do. And that's why the Bible is like, if you, if you can't love your own family, you, you, you can't minister. It's not like a punishment. Oh, you've got naughty kids. Well, you're out. It's like, no, no, this is the importance. It's the order of importance. You look, you're a son of God, looks after your family. From that place, <laughs> minister. It doesn't mean, you know, if your kids are naughty, don't tell people about Jesus. What you're saying is this is the importance of, of, of it all. God's asked you to be a person, a father, a son of God before anything else, even saving a hundred million people, which doesn't make sense to us. But God was not, will not trade your soul for a million other souls. He loves you like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So good. So good. Oh my goodness. All right. Well, I could talk to you forever, but I, I, um, 
would you be willing to pray for whoever's on the real deal right now and listening to us or watching us? And then I want to just pray for you quickly and then I'll close. Unless you have anything else burning in your heart. I know you've got, you always have a wealth of stuff going, but if you, if you don't, are you ready for that? What's your thought? Yeah, no, pray. That's good. It's very good. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So just know that Christ is your righteousness. Mm -hmm. So God is as pleased to see you as he is to see Jesus Christ because you have the same standing. He's just the older brother. You're both kings. He's the king of kings. You're both priests. He's the high priest. You're both brothers. He's the older brother. Father, we come to you in the work of Christ alone. We present you Christ's righteousness, his holiness, his sanctification, and we're grateful for it. And, Father, I ask now for every person hearing this prayer that by your revelation, just by the foolishness of preaching, by hearing a word that brings faith of itself, that we enter that rest, that it is finished. Christ has done it. We believed in the one whom he sent, and so our work is done. We cease from our strivings and our works. We receive the free gift of the person of Christ who is our righteousness. And that is our rest. We rest in that reality. And from here, Father, we ask that you would father us into being like you. Yes. Give us the time, the revelation, the resources, the relationship, the intimacy, the anything that we need. But we would mm -hmm. want to walk in the fullness of the stature of Christ in our lifetime, so you've given us and desire for us. And we want to reveal an aspect of the multifaceted wisdom of God upon the earth. Yes. Heaven to earth, to display it for mankind, creation, and all the cosmos and all the angels. And we look for the redemption of the body, the hope to which we're called. Thank you that we're born in this time. No matter what age we are, thank you that we are here at this time for this for all humanity and now we will just walk with you let's be something and from that person that we are that our behavior in words change thank you. amen i thank you for chris god and i thank you for who he is in your eyes and who he is to me and who he is to the world God, I thank you that most of all, he has helped so many define who they are as sons. And I, I feel like when the football team runs through like this circular thing and they break this membrane and they go through, there's a lot of times, Chris, where you break through by just speaking and other people come along and believe the word. So um, from Corinthians where it says, for God who gives seed to the farmer to plant and later on good crops to harvest and eat, will give you, Chris, more and more seed to plant. And he will make it grow so that you can give away more, more fruit from your harvest. So God, I just thank you for who he is and the harvest that he has, not because he is trying to build or plant or grow the seed, but because he's it's just the seed that you've given him of the word. And so I bless him, God. I pray in the night seasons. I pray for his strength of his body. I pray for his influence. I pray for as he has ministered, all of the things, God, I just, I'm so grateful for his life, God. And I pray that you would continue to sustain him and thank you that you've blessed him, Lord, and will continue to grow him. And I just, I'm thankful to, for today. And I just want to close the way my dad prayed years ago. Lord, we ask for all the people listening. We ask that you help us be the best we can be. And we'll thank you in Christ's name. Amen. 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 I'm so grateful, Chris. I'm so very grateful. Thank you everybody for listening. And, and yeah, until you. next time. Thank you so much, Chris. I so I'm so thrilled to have even met you. I know it's in screen, but if you're ever in Wisconsin, I you know, you have a friend over. You've been listening to The Real Deal with me, Rachel Inaway, helping people celebrate their significance and the genius of God in them. Audio engineering by my husband, Michael Inaway. Thanks, babe. Theme music by Andrew Grace. <laughs>